We're so excited to spend the next 30 minutes exploring, you know, how this pandemic and the recent social movements are shifting the landscape, practices and interaction just across the private equity market. Um, we do encourage you, please use your chat function for any questions that you have that arise during this discussion. We won't actually have a live Q&A session, but they'll be used for additional content and follow-up and just future discussions. So please don't be shy about using the chat function. And since I know everyone's received the full bios of our amazing panelists here today, I will skip the detailed but impressive resumes of each, um, but I do wanna quickly introduce them. So we have Kathleen Fontes. She is head of investor relations at Grain Management. We have Scott Spavogel. He is the co-founder of One Rock Capital Partners and Sean Ward, a managing director at Dial Capital. Thank you all so much for being here today with us. Um, and just to jump right in, you know, something that we're all dealing with is how, you know, is COVID and how does that change our practices? And so I'd be interested to hear from each of you just how has COVID changed your engagement model, both internally with deal flow and how you're managing your internal teams, as well as externally. How are you, how has things had to change just to interact with LPs and, and all of that? So I think, you know, maybe Scott, maybe start us off. Sure. Thanks, Amy. And thanks to the conference organizers. This is a, a truly special event. Um, in terms of the engagement model of how we've had to change, I would say internally, it's been frankly more seamless than I expected. Um, when we all went into lockdown in, in March, we sort of picked up on Zoom and, you know, frankly, the, the internal interactions uh, at One Rock sort of um, picked up right where they left off and, and you know, there wasn't a, a material change. I would say that the, the biggest challenge for us um, has been on the due diligence of investment opportunities. You know, our strategy is one where we like to do buyouts of companies in sort of ugly, hairy, messy situations. And um, we're accustomed to meeting management in person, seeing physical plants, identifying um, for ourselves what the problems of these businesses are and, and how we think we might fix them. And that's a lot more difficult um, in this environment. And so we've had to do some creative things like forming teams that um, are willing to travel to a site, but then um, you know have to be certified by the local protocols at that, at that potential investment opportunity. Um, they have to come back and quarantine for a period of time. So we, we've just had to think more creatively um, as to how we get that done because it is important to our investment model. Yeah, that's that's definitely something we're hearing. Um, Kathleen, what have yeah. you been doing? I would certainly uh, agree with agree with Scott. You know, certain parts of our business have actually accelerated due to the current circumstances. I think fundraising is chief among them. But in agreement, you know, the most important part of navigating these you know last seven months and also navigating these next few months has really been mining and maintaining the existing relationships in the industry, both amongst allocators from my own perspective in investor relations and also industry specific relationships as investors that we have. So those who are able to come out of this, having built upon and, and really strengthened those relationships, in, in our opinion, will we'll really be best positioned to succeed. And of course, it's easier said than done, right? When everything is virtual, it levels, uh, of course, kind of the, the playing field. And and so everyone has equal access to each other, regardless of, of your resources and, and your geography. And so we found ourselves trying to be very intentional about how we shore up um, existing relationships and then forging forging new ones. And so we're making sure we have you know, more and more frequent touch points. And so to to an extent, I think we found success in, in doing that. That's great. And Sean, how about at Dial? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would echo a lot that, that Kathleen and Scott said. I mean, I, I think to a large degree, we're all surviving off of, you know, built up uh, reserves of social capital that we've built up over the past few years and in some cases, decades. And 
you know, our business is one where we buy minority stakes in large alternative asset management firms. And, and that's not something that happens overnight. These are relationships that we've built in most cases over many, many years. But, you know, refreshing that pipeline and going out and meeting new managers, you know, I, I really would uh, echo what Scott said. We we like to be able to look people in the eye and, and shake hands. And and when you can't do that, it, it, uh, as this pandemic drags on, you know, I think we'll, we'll all start to face some challenges on the fundraising side, on the investment side, et cetera. But I think for for large incumbents who've been around for for a good period of time, maybe this just uh, exacerbates our advantages. You know, in that we've been you know spending the time going out and and building these relationships over years and years. I'd hate to be someone with a startup business right now, just trying to trying to get up and running because I, I have to imagine that'd be really difficult. Yeah, and, and building on what all of you just said, you know, there are so many pitfalls of working remotely and doing everything virtually. But, you know, I found myself lately trying to focus on the positives of it because, you know, it, it will end one day, fingers crossed. Um, so I would like to, you know, focus on maybe something positive and Catholic, what's, what's one thing that's actually surprised you for the better um, during this time? Yeah. So, so what I would say is that, investments in, in telecom, right? And, and particularly telecom infrastructure um, where we have our purview, they have an impact we all cannot help but see uh, on every imaginable part of our life, including education um, and economic growth. If it wasn't clear before, it's abundantly so now. And so I think that um, conscientious investors in, in any space, whatever sector it is, we care very, very deeply about how those investments are impacting jobs and opportunity. And I think that has become even more real for private equity fund managers now. Um, and it has really hit very, very close to home. Of course, you know, we're all, um, each of us here, privileged to have this opportunity to, to touch lives and make an impact um, given the field that we're in. It's not easy, right? What what uh, what GPs do, neither is it for the faint of heart, but there's a real reason I think for investors to be confident in the contribution that this asset class has um, in stabilization and, and really the growth of the global economy. So that's been a that's been a, a wonderful surprise and that just, just becoming even more real if it wasn't already. Yeah, that's great. Sean, something positive uh, that you can <laughs> from this. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it, it, a lot of it comes down to, you know, breaking down the barriers between, you know, between people that often exist. We, we usually work in this very sort of artificial environment of being in an office and, and, you know, really only seeing the best of people. I think in this in this environment, you know, we've been able to see a little bit more of, of the reality of people's lives, you know, even in, in these sort of Zoom conversations. Right. I mean, it's hard to imagine uh, a day that goes by where some of us don't have some version of small children or animals or both uh, intruding into a uh, into, into a conversation, and you know I think that can that can be quite helpful to to really you know uh, make make the other side of the conversation more human. Um, and listen, there there are times when you know you wish your your child child weren't screaming and, and barging into the room, but um, but that said, I think it's it, it it's helpful to remind everyone that you know we're not just faces on a screen and that. You know, people are going through a, a lot of different things right now. So I think that that uh, that uh, element of humanity is certainly something that that's that's a positive coming out of this uh, out of this experience. Well, not that we're coming out of it, but wherever we are in this experience right now, I cannot. Yeah, I totally agree. I think I think the authenticity of interactions has actually been highlighted by this. I know as a mom of a two and a four year old, I have experienced that, but you learn other people are, you know, the parents of kids and it gives you kind of a nice point of reference. So I, I totally agree with that. Um, and Scott, how about you? Um, well, I, I think there's also, you know, something related to the human aspect of, of being on Zoom all day is that, um, you know, there's, there's only uh, so much of that that you can take. Um, in, it's certainly in one sitting. And so, um, you know, for me, uh, it's about 90 minutes that I can I can sit on Zoom. Uh, after that, I've got to go do something else um, or, you know, work on something quietly or or, you know, something has to be switched up. And so um, meetings have had to be more efficient than 90 minutes. Um, hopefully, 
meetings in most people lot people's lives are, are more efficient than 90 minutes but um, it's really uh, it's really been uh, a, a point uh, internally that we've tried to make is that um, you know we're not going to soak up everybody's time just being on zoom all day that um, we're going to meet for a specific reason and then we're going to uh, move on and do something else and that's something that I hope will sort of carry over in the post-covid world uh, to Sean's point whenever that may come Perfect. So switching gears a little bit, um, I, I'd be interesting, you know, we work with a lot of LPs and fundraising and due diligence has definitely changed. Um, and so I'd be interested to hear, you know, maybe Scott, starting with you, I know that you've gone through some fundraising during this. How have you had to adapt your processes uh, to be successful? And what what are some things you've had to do, you know, to get a to get diligence done. So, so we we basically taken the lead from uh, the LP and tried to meet them where they are. And if that is that they want to, um, you know, uh, do all day Zoom meetings, then, then then we'll do that. If it's that they want to have um, shorter meetings with fewer people, um, we'll do that. If it's more of a question and answer on paper uh, to help them with whatever internal materials that they're preparing for their investment committee, uh, we'll do that. And I can't say that there's one uh, thing in particular, but but overall, I would say that whereas LPs used to come to our office uh, here in New York and, and, and in LA, um, they certainly can't go to all 40 offices when, when all 40 of us are working remotely, come to each of our homes. So, um, I've actually been super impressed about how LPs have pivoted uh, to Zoom to get comfortable uh, in making uh, commitments to what is essentially a 10 plus year uh, partnership. I agree. I think I've been very impressed with how adaptable both on the GP and the LP front from not being prepared at all to do such things to now being able to get so much accomplished um, virtually. So I agree. Sean, how about how about you? How how have things changed in the fundraising and diligence world? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's been it's been very interesting, and and we have the benefit, of course, of working with a lot of our partner managers that we own stakes in to, you know, to work with them during their fundraisers as well. And and you know, I, I would agree with Scott. It's definitely not one size fits all, and and different geographies have different investor preferences, and and you have to learn how to meet them. And of course, the the time zones can be challenging on that front as well. But it is what it is. I mean. You know, something we've always prided ourselves, you know, at Dial On is is really, you know, being willing to put in the time and the and the shoe leather and the the hours on the airplane. And now you can't do that. And to some degree, that's a disadvantage for us because we've always, I think, set ourselves apart by being willing being willing to fly around the world to do one meeting if that's what it comes to. Um, now, you know, we we really can only get on a Zoom and 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 everyone can do that. Um, but you know, I think being extremely responsive and and being very bespoke in what you do, and also providing as much information as you can in a somewhat decentralized format. So, you know, if you pre-record some, you know, investor sessions, sort of due diligence sessions that you know everyone is going to want to have, you know, the the ODD sessions and the investment process session and so forth, and make that available in your data room and allow people to sort of uh, access it at their leisure, understanding, of course, that they're going to want to have live Zooms and have follow-up questions and all that, but it can be more efficient both for you and for them to, so that they can work around your investor, it can work around their schedule and, and knock out a lot of the work. Um, and then hopefully, you know, you're, you're to, as Scott described, you're, you're dealing with more of a Q&A situation rather than, okay, let's all sit on Zoom for the next three hours while we talk about, you know, business continuity planning or whatever. <laughs> yes, very true. Um, Kathleen, I'd be interested, you know, since you are, investor relations uh, have you seen the current market circumstances have it has it changed or slowed lp commitments anything that you've seen on that front yeah so i mean listen i've been looking at the same reports that we all have looked at and kind of breathed a bit of a sigh of relief right where we see that now fundraising has rebounded a bit among um I think generally, um, and, and even among certain sectors during COVID, but it has been across fewer funds, right? So I think um, conditions right now are, 
are probably better if we read the data that way for more established funds and GPs who might have been you know, doing this for a while. So I think the stakes are, are pretty high given the volatility of the markets and, and that uncertainty definitely advantages you know, more tenured firms or, or, or specialists. And, and the way investments have rebounded depends on the sector, right? So energy um, might be having a harder time. Hospitality might be on the rebound now. Um, telecom, I think, because we're all here, right, has been either net neutral or, or maybe even positive um, in terms of the experience. Um, but the result, I think, hasn't been a departure from putting capital to work. I think now it's it's probably more of a flight to uh, the well known or a flight to quality, and so um, obviously track record continues to be important. And and so, you know, there are there are a handful that will continue to do well, and um, and accelerate maybe even um, in terms of their fundraising efforts. And um, and so we've seen that. Um, I think those investors. Um, most likely, most likely to succeed on on the investing front are those who are, you know, marketing more than just you know money. Um, in terms of um, being able to win deal flow, obviously, you know, expertise, relationships, and an ability to serve as a real partner um, creates greater value um, than the sum of its parts. And so, I think that'll continue to be a real success. And 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 LPs are looking for that. I, I agree. I know, you know, on the consulting side, we're we're dealing with this with pipeline building. And I totally agree with what you said. You know, it's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of investors kind of had their 2020 pipeline planned out and known, you know, kind of in late 2019, because you really have to plan a year ahead in what you're looking at for the for the future. And so I know we had a lot of investors that had already met with managers or their 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 reups, and so you know they know the manager, and so they're able to execute those. So I feel like with COVID, we actually the 2020 investment um, landscape was okay because we'd done enough of the legwork in you know late 2019 and early 2020 before the pandemic hit. It'll be interesting going into 2021, you know, because I know some limited partners actually have like regulatory constraints that they have to meet a manager. And if there is a travel ban that continues, um, you know, for next year, it's it's an interesting thing to try to build a pipeline. Um, and I think it's gonna be a little more challenging. And I and I do think that a lot of um, investors are looking at those re-ups and maybe increasing those re-ups so that they don't fall short in pacing, but maybe are more restricted in being able to add new managers. Um, the other thing is maybe looking at policies and and changing some of those to allow someone to make a new investment to a manager that they've only met on Zoom. So I, I agree. I think the established managers um, are have a little bit of a foot up there, um, but I think hopefully we'll continue to adapt in, in 2021. Um, and, and building, you know, on this again, we've all kind of spent most of this year virtually um, and I think we've all seen some lessons learned uh, when it comes to virtual meetings, some funny, some, you know, really uh, interesting. So I was wondering, um, you know, because this is very real life and implementable, you know, today for us. Uh, Sean, what would be your number one suggestion for a successful Zoom call? Well, I think if it's if it's an individual Zoom call, you know, they're probably just, you know, obvious things, I guess, have have good lighting, don't have anything strange in your background, um, you know, dress professionally. I think, you know, we've all probably seen variants of things that maybe aren't aren't that professional. Um, you know, I think where the where some interesting questions come in, uh, again, something Scott mentioned earlier, when you have a longer program, you know, or maybe it's a diligence, a multi-session diligence day, you know, breaking it up and giving people some some opportunity to get up and move around, you know, is, is really important. And it's, it sounds obvious, but we've certainly seen a lot of folks who don't necessarily get the drill. And it's probably easy to forget when you're on the presenting side, you know, if there are multiple people presenting, and so it's moving right along from your perspective, but you forget on the other side of the camera, 
if you're expecting people to sit there for three hours, you know, that's just not reasonable. You should give some give some breaks. I will also just mention a, a sort of a funny thing that happened and, and, and easy for people to forget, I think. You know, keep in mind that some, with some of the programs like Zoom and so forth, if you when you freeze your, your, your camera or turn your camera off, oftentimes there's a picture that pops up that you've set as some sort of default or, or maybe your kid is set as a default if they're in virtual schooling. And so um, I, I had at least one call where someone went off, you know, offline uh, on video and a picture of their, you know, their pet cat popped up, which was a little bit, a little bit off-putting in the middle of a, of a presentation. Uh, you know, certainly not the end of the world. And, and after all, they're the LP, so they could put whatever they want. But, um, uh, but yeah, it's probably something worth keeping in mind or, or double checking if your kid's been playing around with your, uh, with your computer. That is a good one. I actually have not done that myself, so I will look at that. I like that. Um, Scott, do you have do you have anything here? Uh, one of the things that I just noticed, um, you know, being on a lot of uh, board meetings with our portfolio companies is that if you're on the receiving end of a, of a presentation, it, people can tell when you're not paying attention. It's sort of like being in the room with them. If they're, if they're not making eye contact, it probably means they're doing emails or some kind of uh, multitasking. And, um, you know, that's that's a little off-putting to somebody who's... Uh, Who's presenting? You may not think that they see you do that, but um, they can definitely tell. That's a good one. And speaking of virtual meetings, I know many of us on this um, panel and on this call have participated in virtual AGMs. Catholic, I know um, your firm recently moved to a virtual format. So, anything suggestions for success learned from that experience? Yeah, we we did, and and like many others in, in the normal world, you know, we typically host a, a very traditional, you know, highly rehearsed AGM in the fall each year. So when we all found ourselves at home in March, we we did decide pretty early on to pivot. Um, some some wait you waited and and saw kind of how things would work, but I think that little extra time allowed us to make a plan for for a virtual event um, that was going to be a combination of what LPs were, were used to, um, which was still a produced and, and very efficiently run pre-recorded fund update, which as a firm, it's the right thing to do, right? And, and you can kind of control the variables that we're talking about, right? Um, children and, and pets and so forth that could unexpectedly present themselves. And then we combine that with a brief, you know, live portion. Right, Q and A. So I think um, it, it gave both, right? It, it gave the information that's required, and then it still gave that personal um, bit of interaction. So, so that's that's how we approached it, and I think we found some success in that. Right. Switching gears a little bit here, you know, another area that's been discussed a lot today. It's also, you know, been I know I've heard and read so many things. Um, so there's been increasing demand for diversity and inclusion in the private equity market, um, you know, and, and really across, but, you know, in the private equity market, we've seen, you know, I know for me, it's the first time I've actually had boards um, request diversity information, not just from the staff level. So um, I'm interested to hear what each of your firms have been doing just around d and uh, Sean, maybe start with you. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly been a key area of focus for us, and and you know we do our best to to walk walk the walk. I mean, certainly we've partnered with some great firms like like Clear Lake and Vista, who are minority-owned businesses, and and you know that that's hardly a hardship. They're they're really extremely successful, well-run businesses as well. Um, but we what what we're really focused on now is you know expanding the funnel of talent at the at the bottom because I think you know everyone here is all the time like, well, you know. We're really searching for the right candidates, but there just aren't people with the seniority that we're looking for. And so to try to attack that, we've become very involved. And, and my partner, Michael Reese, is on the board of a group called OpNet, which provides internships to college students, you know, 92 percent of whom are the first people in their family to go to college. You know, the average family income is something like thirty five thousand dollars. And we we host a number of them at, at Dial, but we also encourage our partners to, to take interns on as well. And, and it's not just a summer only event, there's ongoing mentorship that goes along with it. And, it, and we're, we're extremely involved. And certainly if anyone would ever like to uh, learn more about the organization, don't hesitate to reach out. That's great. Kathleen, how about you? 
Yeah, so our firm, um, Grain Management, it, it's it's actually extremely diverse, right? So three quarters of our employees can be characterized as diverse. And so that said, um, while we have been successful, I think obviously at building this sort of profile, when, when an LP asks me for a policy, we haven't spent as much time like writing down, right? How, how we did it, I think it was just who the firm was from the very beginning. And if you dig into the success in that regard, and, and I really appreciate having the opportunity to prepare for this part and to really think about it, it's it really is just ingrained, I think, in who the firm is and, and who its leadership is. And, and not only past hiring, but but the pipeline obviously is important, um, as, as, as Sean said. And, it's, it's not something that you can kind of shoehorn into an existing identity. Um, it, it really has to blend, you know, all across the firm, it has to be in your culture and, and in the firm's values. And it has to start at the top. And so what worked for Grain might not work for all, what works for Dial might not work for someone else, I think. Um, and then other thing that I'll add is that we do look for skill sets that, that aren't specific to any one university right or or institution um that's not to say that we don't hire from ivy league schools we do and we have but i think looking at core skills and competencies through a different sort of lens has, has allowed us to really widen our aperture and and build a, a really top notch workforce um, from a broad pipeline um there's still more work for us to do i think um I, after looking through the numbers, about five out of 12 leadership team members are female, but 18 of 22 members of the investment team are, are males. So we have you know, some improvement to do in terms of gender diversity, but I think um, we feel good about um, the push, right, that we have from, from David Grain, who, who's our founder, to do better, uh, who's pushing us in that direction. Great, and I know we're reaching time, Scott, 30 seconds on. Sure, your happy, to, happy to go through it quickly. So um, we're a fairly young firm. We've been around for 10 years and um, I'm lucky enough to have as my co-founder, um, a person of color. Um, and we, we fundamentally believe that better investment decisions are made uh, when you have differing viewpoints represented around the investment committee table. And so from the very beginning, we've had a culture of inclusion. And what that has translated to is that about half of our professional force is um, either women or people of color or both. And two thirds of our investment committee are women, people of color or both. And, and, and like grain management, it's sort of been done organically. We don't have many policies other than just a general non-discrimination policy, but it's really, um, it's, it's, it's really showed up in the numbers. That's great. I know I recently heard a quote on a panel that seems fitting here. It said diversity is the what and inclusion is the how, you know, having diverse teams is great. And that's definitely step one. But then equally important is just the inclusion and make everyone feel comfortable in expressing their point of view and feeling valued and appreciated. So I really appreciate everything that everyone is um, that everyone is doing here. So wrapping up, um, I cannot believe we are out of time, but thank you so much to all of the panelists. These, this was great insight and perspective that really resonated with everyone. Um, with that, I hope everyone has a great day and I will now turn it back over to Sancia.